Hello and welcome to the episode 262 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today, among other things, we'll focus on a bird, the continuation of the filming of Magical Mystery Tour, and the loss of Northern Songs. On the 19th of September 1934, Brian Epstein was born in Liverpool. Epstein was of Lithuanian and Jewish descent, and his family had a chain of shops selling furniture and goods known as North End Music Stores, or NEMS, when Brian became the manager of the Beatles. His role in the history of the band is a fundamental one. Thanks to Brian and his dedication, the lads managed to break the confines of Liverpool and, eventually, managed to make it in Great Britain and then all over the world. In 1959, the Quarrymen, now a guitar quartet featuring Ken Brown, George Harrison, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, performed their fourth Saturday evening at the Casbah Coffee Club in Liverpool. One year later, in 1960, the Beatles, featuring Pete Best on drums and Stu Sutcliffe on bass, performed at the Indra Club in Hamburg, West Germany, for the 34th of 48 nights. Moving on to 1961, we find the Beatles, with Pete Best still on drums and Paul McCartney now on bass, performing a lunchtime slot at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. Same venue in 1962, this time for a nighttime engagement. The Beatles now featured Ringo Starr on drums. Finally, a day off for the Fabs in 1964 during their first North American tour. They had some rest in a remote ranch in Missouri. They had been flown in from Dallas, Texas, on a private plane belonging to Reed Pigman, a millionaire who also owned the ranch. In 1966, John Lennon was in Carboneras, Spain, for the shooting of How I Won the War. The shooting mostly took place in the morning and Lennon later commented that he got bored of the endless hanging around with nothing to do. This was not just during the days, but also during the evening free time that was mostly spent in the house the production had rented near Almeria. John took the chance to rest, spending time with his wife Cynthia, Beatles' assistant Neil Aspinall, and actor Michael Crawford and his family, and composing new material. Strawberry Fields Forever, for example, was written during the stay in Spain. Meanwhile, in India, George Harrison decided to give a press conference to answer all of the questions from the local press in one go, and try to regain some privacy to enjoy his Indian trip. The press conference was held at the Taj Mahal Hotel in Bombay, George explained the reasons for his visit to India, his desire to study Indian music, and asked to be granted the privacy needed to complete his studies. Let's move to the 19th of September 1967. Another glaring organizational mistake brought the filming of Magical Mystery Tour at the West Malling Air Station in Kent. The initial plan was to get into the Shepperton Studios to complete the shooting of the film in a week. The trouble was that nobody had thought that the facility needed to be booked well in advance, weeks, if not months, before the shooting. And so the space turned out to be occupied, as it was every other film studios in London. The crew reconvened in this World War II airspace working both inside and around the enormous empty hangar from 9 am for the next six days to complete the shooting of the film. Several interior scenes were filmed, including George's Blue Jay Way section, Aunt Jessie's Dream, in which John Lennon shoveled spaghetti onto Jesse Robbins's plate, and the magician's laboratory section. The sequence with Major McCartney, featuring Paul and Victor Spinetti, was shot in a nearby hut, turned into an army recruitment office. Sequences filmed outside included the scene in which Victor Spinetti shouts orders at a fake cow, the marathon sequence in which Mal Evans, 
Neil Aspinall and other passengers were shot on the main runaway of the base, a scene with 12 children and several blindfolded vicars, and the I am the Warrus section. Same situation here, with lots of good curiosities and information that are not available in this version of What A Fab Day. In this case, though, you have the option of acquiring the extended version of the podcast. How? You can find that out visiting www.simonmas.com support. On that page, as usual, you will also get information on how to otherwise support me in the creation of more music-related content. Believe me, there's a lot cooking, and your help can make it happen. Even a simple shout-out on your social media can help this community grow. Thank you for being fab! On the 19th of September 1968, the Beatles were at the EMI Studios between 7.15 pm and 5.30 am, recording 11 takes of the rhythm track of Piggies, George Harrison's newest song. The session was moved to Studio One, the biggest studio space in Abbey Road, the Beatles usually recorded in Studio Two, where producer Chris Thomas had discovered the harpsichord set up for a classical recording happening the next day. Thomas, as requested by George, performed the harpsichord part on the song, a job granting him an extra nine pounds, about 157 pounds in 2020 money. George also played something to Thomas. His reply was enthusiastic, but George was unwilling to present the song to his bandmates for consideration, feeling that his work was not given proper attention. The song was proposed to Joe Cocker and recorded in 1969, although his version ended up being released after the Beatles had finally accepted to record the song on their own and had released it on Abbey Road. Let's come to 1969. It was on this date that the Beatles lost control of Northern Songs, the publishing company that managed the rights of all Lennon-McCartney compositions and several from George Harrison. Dick James, their partner and head of Northern Songs, had decided to sell his shares of the publishing to ATV in April, without giving advance notice to the band. In order to maintain control of the company, the Beatles needed to acquire a further 23.1% of the shares, borrowing heavily from Harry Hans Bakker and Company, an investment bank. 15% of this 23.1% could come from private investors that held positions in Northern Songs, but John Lennon put a final nail in the coffin of the deal when, characteristically, commented that he wasn't, and I quote, prepared to be fucked around by men in suits sitting on their fat asses in the city. Unsurprisingly, that alienated the private investors. Anyhow, today, the private investors ended up selling their shares to ATV, despite ATV's offer was lower than the Beatles. Still resentful for Lennon's remarks, they were evidently tired of Klein's delaying tactics and scared that the Beatles might stop producing music for the time being. They chose a less profitable, but more secure way out. ATV thus got its hand on 54% of Northern songs. John Eastman vetoed any deal with ATV proposed by Klein, in whose negotiation he didn't take part, and so the Beatles eventually ended up selling their shares to ATV, too. If you wonder how deep this wound was, notice that to this day, Paul McCartney talks about how upset he is that their publishing was taken away from them. Later on in the day, Paul McCartney gave a lengthy interview to BBC Radio 1 reporter David Wigg for Seen and Heard, to promote Abbey Road. The interview was edited in two parts and broadcasted on the 21st of September and on the 28th of September, both times between 3 and 4 pm. But this was not the only exposure the band got from BBC. In an unprecedented move, 
the national broadcaster devoted an entire show of the late night lineup to the release of Abbey Road. The show was aired today between 10.55 and 11.30 pm and incorporated bits of the Linda McCartney 16mm film shot on the 22nd of August at Tittenhurst. The film and some stills of the band given by Apple to BBC were the only contribution the Beatles gave to the program. This concludes our episode today. Tomorrow, we'll see the immediate outcome of the Beatles losing control of Northern songs. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.